everyone, so I wanted to provide you with a, a review of chapter 13, uh, basically how populations change over time. And not only that, but to reconnect you with some of the, the vocabulary in the AP Biology curriculum. So go back to the big ideas, the uh, enduring understandings, and the essential knowledge. So to, just to reconnect all that for you. Evolution is part of big idea number one. It's uh, the fact that evolution drives uh, not only diversity in living systems, but also uh, unity. So you're going to see the diversity of things and the unity of things based on evolution. So keep that in mind. Uh, getting to our first enduring understanding, this is a, basically a definition of what evolution is. It's a change in the genetic makeup uh, of a population over time. That's evolution. Uh, we discuss this in a number of ways. One of the ways I want to key you um, in on is, is that we've discussed this mathematically through the Hardy-Weinberg equation. Okay, so the, the new thrust in AP biology is to uh, make our studies quantitative. Uh, so the quantitative aspect, you've been able to, to show me how allele frequencies change over time. You've been able to use Hardy-Weinberg equation uh, you know, for many different questions. So keep that in mind uh, as we move forward here. Now the first uh, essential knowledge that you have to uh, remember when talking about uh, evolution is that natural selection is the major mechanism of evolution. Um, we talked about this a number of different ways, but let me compare uh, really quickly artificial selection and natural selection. So in artificial selection, uh, essentially you have a, a designer, uh, usually that's man, that uh, is, is hand selecting uh, organisms for various traits. Um, so sort of guiding an organism, whether it's a, a beef cow, a, a dairy cow, or if it's uh, variants of this wild mustard uh, plant. Uh, you can artificially select for various aspects of this plant and create things like broccoli, uh, which really focuses on the flowers and stems. You can create Brussels, Brussels sprouts, which focuses on the lateral buds. Okay, so that's artificial selection. That's man artificially selecting things for traits that they, they deem valuable. Natural selection, on the other hand, is... Uh, where nature uh, basically selects for organisms that are best suited for their environment. So you get to um, you know this beautiful mantid here um, and it blending in with its environment because nature is selecting for this camouflage. Okay, So organisms that have this camouflage are better suited for their environment. They're camouflaged, they avoid predators, and they pass on their genes uh, more frequently. Because of this, the population tends to look more and more like them. So their camouflage is selective. Um, you know, take for example this other mantid that's in another environment that's uh, you know full of green le uh, leaves. It's going to look differently, um, but it's also a, a form of natural selection, a, a form of success uh, based on it being suited for its environment. Uh, you know, natural natural selection gives us beautiful organisms like this. Artificial selection uh, gives us beautiful things too. But I, you know, I have to say that. You know, this, this cute little pug here, nature would have taken a pass, right? But humans have deemed him cute, and so they've selected for him. They've made him that, even though he, he can probably barely breathe on his own and would not have been selected for naturally. Okay, so be able to contrast uh, artificial and natural selection. Natural selection, again, defined is, uh, you know, you take a population of, in this case, insects, okay? And uh, if you apply pesticides to them, you're going to basically be selecting for organisms, in this case the, 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 the pests, that have certain pesticide resistance genes. So this is represented here by the, the various green and red alleles. Uh, so in this case, a red allele confers resistance to a pesticide in this insect population. The ones that are green, the ones that don't have the resistant allele, they die off, they're selected against, they're not fit for their environment in which they're going to be sprayed with pesticides. Um, the ones that do have that allele are fit for their environment. They stay alive. And because they're able not only to survive, but to reproduce after that, to, to remain living and reproduce, the population over time is going to carry their alleles and thus also have the phenotype of pesticide resistance. So over time, the population looks like that. You get an allele frequency shift. So keep in mind that fitness is not only the phenotype, this pesticide resistance, but it's the ability to pass uh, these genes and these alleles onto the next generation to also confer resistance. Uh, so this illustrates perfectly one of the key concepts you need to keep in mind. 
and that is that a diverse gene pool is key to evolution. Okay, so evolution, natural selection, essentially is is uh, one way to look at it is that's trying to make the gene pool homogeneous. You know, it's trying to select for those alleles that best confer some sort of advantage in a natural environment. Uh, but that's actually not good for a species, right? You you do not want to have a homogeneous uh, gene pool. Uh, the diversity of alleles, uh, which is maintained through sexual reproduction, random random mutation. This is a key part of, of evolution. Even though random mutations are rare, uh, when they come along, they can actually confer a great benefit onto uh, an organism that has them. A lot of times they're they're negative, but they can confer benefits. So why is it good to be have a diverse gene pool? Uh, the environment changes. Over time, you're going to see things that are underwater surface. You're going to see things that are uh, environments that are cold become warm, warm become cold. Uh, so organisms that have the alleles to make those adaptations and thus adjust to their environment are going to be uh, successful. Without the ability to do that, you're done. Uh, you're not even going to be able to adapt. Um, now, depending on the stability of that environment, you're going to see different variations in how those alleles change over time. Common sense would show you that if your environment is stable, you're not going to get a, a rapid turnover of alleles in an environment um, because there's going to be that natural selection process and it's going to maintain a certain allele frequency. But if you do get a fluctuation, you're going to see a rise and fall of uh, different alleles in a given population. Okay, so um, keep in mind again, I keep on mentioning it, but it's, it bears repeating, uh, evolution is quantitative, okay? There's no better example than Hardy-Weinberg equation. Everybody, listen, you, you will be tested on Hardy-Weinberg in some fashion, uh, so don't avoid it. Be sure that you can get the points just by doing a simple equation. Okay, so it shows you how allele frequencies change over time. Um, you know, for, for my students, there's a pen cast on how to do all those Hardy-Weinberg equations. Um, to maintain Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, population must be large. There cannot be migration. You can't have no net mutations. Uh, random mating. Uh, you, you can't. You, you can't have um, uh, selection, right? So the, the the thing is, is that you know you're probably realizing right now that um, a lot of these things, okay. You can't have random mating. Uh, you, you have to have an absence of selection. These things, you know, don't happen, right? So um, you always have some form of selection in an environment. So natural selection is always occurring. Um, so what you're realizing is that these conditions are, are rarely, if ever, met. Um, so keep that in mind. That Hardy-Weinberg is not. Um, it's not a real life, real case scenario. So really what the Hardy-Weinberg equation is showing you is not if a population is evolving, it's telling you how rapidly it's evolving. Uh, so you can compare it over time to see if it's, um, see if it is, uh, if it's rapidly changing. Okay, so if that allele frequency is changing really quickly, there's rapid evolution occurring. Okay, this leads me to another um, essential, piece of essential knowledge. Okay, so it's not just about natural selection. Um, you know, this is the logical portion of, of natural selection. You get random uh, mutation. Natural selection puts it into motion in a logical fashion. But there are other events uh, that influence evolution. Okay, uh, random events that can change a population's gene pool, change a population's allele frequency, especially those small ones. And what comes to mind for me are these cases of genetic drift um, and gene flow. Okay, so um, these instances of, of genetic drift, you know, the bottleneck effect and the founder effect, you guys know what these things mean already. Um, so I'm not going to go into great detail, but suffice it to say that you can totally misrepresent and totally change a population uh, based on certain events. So bottlenecking is associated with some sort of natural disaster that um, because of that disaster, the, 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 the population that survives, um, the allele frequencies may be, rep may be misrepresented uh, when compared to the original population. Um, I don't have time to go into these, but uh, suffice it to say that these are the random things that can totally change a population and, and the allele frequencies. Um, check the, if you want to review that, the BioFlix um, on our website you know, will help you. 
Okay, so this is an important concept. So natural selection acts on phenotypic variations in the environment. So there's this dynamic interaction between the actual phenotype and natural selection. So keep in mind, mutations spur those initial changes leading to various phenotypes, but it's the phenotype in the environment that are going to interact and natural selection is going to select for or against that phenotype. Because of this, natural selection leads to adaptive evolution. Okay, so these organisms that have been selected for in their environment uh, are really successful at what they do. So when you're looking at a cheetah population, all cheetahs are fast. All, all cheetahs, um, you know, have the, the, the muscular and bone structure to be uh, built for speed. Uh, this is not the case if you're, you know, if the population that's surviving, you know, is wiped after a volcano uh, is surviving. They're not necessarily guaranteed to be fit for their environment like a cheetah is after natural selection, okay? I should also say, right, that, you know, not only is a cheetah fit for its environment through natural selection, but so are its prey. Um, so prey are evolving also, which is why you don't see a bunch of dead antelope um, or whatever cheetahs hunt uh, lying around, right? Because they're just as fast. Their ancestors are also passing down speed genes that help them aboard, avoid predators. So keep that in mind too, that it's, uh, it's dynamic. These things are evolving together in, the, in, a, in an environment. Okay. So environmental change, uh, I think that's supposed to be, can act as a selective mechanism on population. So yeah, obviously environment is, uh, environment's an important factor. Uh, I think that should be can. Uh, environment totally uh, as a selective mechanism against, um, for evolution, right? So. Um, you know, which organisms stand out in location A? Well, definitely this little black mouse, but if this black mouse was on a lava flow, as we saw in that um, HHMI video, Making of the Fittest, they'd blend in just fine, whereas the, the light-colored mouse would, would stand out like a sore thumb. So keep that in mind. Um, I would like for you to know all this vocab. Um, these figures will, you know, help you make sense of what is stabilizing selection, what is directional, what is disruptive. That's in your book. Uh, so this phenotypic variation, I don't want to think, I don't want you to think that all um, changes in phenotype are going to help an organism. For the most part, a lot of times um, they're bad. So in that example of the pocket mouse, if you are a uh, black mouse, if you, if you inherit that phenotype uh, from your geno due to your genotype, um, that's bad news. But if you happen to find yourself on a on a lava flow, well, that's good. So. There's a logical flow to this. I've given you all the following examples that show you um, that good phenotypes lead to higher fitness. In other words, if you have a phenotype that best suits you for environment, you're going to survive, you're going to reproduce, the population will then take on your alleles over time. Um, you know, we mentioned this before with uh, pesticide resistant um, bugs, but humans have an impact on the variation seen in other organisms. You can see this with, um, you know, the organisms that we keep around for for for, um, for food, right? So, dairy cattle. Uh, you can see this in the the loss of diversity from crop species, and certainly from overuse of antibiotics and the and the accompanying antibiotic resistant bacteria. This is a huge problem. This is because humans are playing a role in the variations that we're seeing organisms. I don't have time to elaborate. Um, you know, in, in one minute, how can we cover uh, diploidy? Well, suffice it to say that the in natural selection is is um, is basically selecting the, the best suited alleles. But you do still see, you know, quote, inferior alleles, some of these so-called recessive ones. Uh, they're protected from uh, selection in a heterozygote state. So they would only be selected against if they were homozygous recessive. Um, that's a protection. So those are examples of balancing selections where um, in an environment you'll see two or more phenotypes in a population because two or more alleles are around. We talked about this with malaria, guys. This is a classic example of a heterozygous advantage. Um, don't have time to elaborate, but suffice it to say that uh, being a heterozygote having one of those alleles is protective. 
uh, we, we watched a video on why, so you should be able to tell me about that, okay? Take care.